longer to linger. Stand with me if you're able to eight eight. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. service in prayer. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. 291. I am coming, Lord. 291. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee, for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Coming thick and mock, thou dost my strength assure, thou dost my vileness fully cleanse, till spotless all and pure. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me. calls me on to perfect faith and love, to perfect hope and peace and trust for earth and heaven above. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood. Three hundred eight. I surrender all. Three hundred eight. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will.
number four. All to Jesus I And 314, more love to thee. 314. singing this evening. Thank you, uh, Miss Heidi and Mike and Mr. Kristen. Anybody have a testimony to share tonight? <clears throat> Brother Nathan. Amen. <laughs> Every, day, Every day, all day. Yes, right. God's still good. Do be uh, in prayer for Brother Bob Elliott. We're not feeling well. He did go into... Um, he did go into the hospital on Monday. Let me just read you uh, the response. Thought it was angina, but it wasn't, um, I think is what they said. But um, let me just get this straight. Uh, lab tests are okay on Bob's heart. He has the start of pneumonia, so he needs to take antibiotics. And so um, do be in prayer for Bob, not, not feeling well. Um, Anybody else uh, with a word of testimony or praise? Miss Cindy. Amen. Sometimes it's good to look back to see what the Lord has done for you. It encourages you to keep on going, doesn't it? Amen. Brother. Dan here tonight. 
Hey, it's right. Amen. Okay, Gladys, prayer for the sweet being, feet being swelled. Yep, Brother Andy. Uh, hey, yeah, <laughs> Miss Paula. Yeah. Right, amen. All right, do be keep continue to be in prayer for Ukraine. Um, God wants to wants us to accept Him in His goodness, but um, if we won't accept Him in goodness, then severity uh, of the Lord oftentimes brings us to repentance. Uh, Brother Ram, yeah, Ram drops uh, some steel on his foot, and that swelled up last Wednesday, so. Yeah, doing better then. Amen. That's good. Praise the Lord. All right, take your Bibles tonight. Oh, for as far as announcements, don't forget Friday. Friday um, is our family um, fun night, game night. And so uh, do remember that at 5 o'clock starting with dinner. And... Um, we will just bring bring whatever you, you want. I'm sure that'll be fine. We were supposed to have a sign-up list, but I forgot to get that printed off. So just bring whatever you want. And um, and that'll be a fun time. Um, then on Saturday, 11 o'clock, weather permitting. Uh, yeah, last Saturday it was cold and wet. But uh, weather permitting, we'll be going out at 11 o'clock. So do remember that as well. The Lord allows you to be a part of that. All right, Genesis chapter 3, this, this evening, Genesis 3, God's presence, the solution to stress. Genesis chapter 3, where it all began. Now, <clears throat> the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. <coughs> and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her, her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 
And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I certainly read this passage with sadness and think of what things could have been. And yet, Lord, if it had been me, it had been the same thing, maybe even quicker. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn the, the um, lessons that we need to learn to restore the fellowship that was broken. And I pray that you would be glorified in this time together, that you would um, be with those who, who need prayer. Think of Gladys tonight. Um, think of uh, Brother Bob tonight. Um, pray that you would touch them with, a, with your healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Last Wednesday, we were looking at the concept of uh, success under stress. And we mentioned that stress is not always a bad thing, but there is bad stress and there is good stress. We often relate uh, stress to blood pressure, don't we? Well, his blood pressure is high. He's been stressed out lately. Um, and that's a good uh, analogy. You know, having some blood pressure is a good thing. Um, having too much blood pressure is not. And so the Lord, the stress that the Lord uh, puts upon us, what I could call godly stress, is, is a good thing. And it is for our health and, and well-being. But um, most of the time, we add that stress due to selfishness, due to sin in our lives, and due to... Uh, listening to Satan, all three of these things visible in our passage tonight. This is where it all began. This is where um, stress, as we typically think of it, began in the world. God designed stress, or, or what God allows um, in our lives, is designed to bring contentment, peace, and rest. We see this concept taught to us in, in the book of Hebrews. Adam and Eve in the garden, God had duties for them. He had responsibilities for them. You could say they had a, a moderate amount of pressure and work to do. It wasn't like there was an absence of pressure, but it was good. God said, it is good. It was good. In eternity, you and I will have duties to do. It's not like we'll be on some eternal vacation on a beach somewhere. No, that would, that would get uh, pretty boring pretty quick. Um, no, it certainly wouldn't be restful for very long. But we will be at rest because we will be in the presence of God. Um, years ago, University of, uh, of Arizona built what they called uh, Biosphere 2. It was uh, this massive building, uh, what they thought was a utopia, a paradise, um, where... There was perfect growing conditions for everything. And the thing that they found out after two years of having these perfect conditions with plants growing was that the trees did not have enough strength to, to stand um, after a few years because there was no resistance. There was no wind. And so um, they, the, the, the trees need that wind in order to gain strength. And so... Um, it is in our lives, we need to have the pressure and the stress that God intends, but we don't need all that added 
pressure and junk that we bring upon ourselves. Um, we hear a lot about coping mechanisms today, coping mechanisms. God never intended for us to cope. He intended to give us freedom. He intended to, to free us and give us a way of escape. You know, I, I think I said this last week, but the word stress is not found in the Bible. It's not found in the Bible, but the concept certainly is there. Romans chapter 8 and uh, verses 18 through 22, the Apostle Paul refers to the, the stress introduced by sin when he says the sufferings of this present time. He, he says the bondage of corruption, the creation groaning and travailing in pain. Many times this is brought on because of our selfishness, because of our sin, because of our listening to the devil, the Satan. <clears throat> but in some cases, what is allowed by God is referred to with terms such as chastening or temptations or trials. The Apostle Peter speaks of the, the, the trial, um, the fiery trial that uh, which shall try you. Um, James says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Um, the chastening of God for the present seemeth not to be joyous, but grievous. What is that? That's that's a, a stress that God deems that you and I need to grow. But uh, stress is a reality that we all have to deal with. And so understanding the root of it from a biblical basis, from a biblical approach, will help us to understand how God wants us to, wants us to uh, deal with it. And here we have where it all began. Where it all began. We have the temptation uh, verses 1 through 6, we have the temptation, and you know what? That's really uh, no sin in being tempted. It is sin when we give in to that temptation. So we have the temptation here. As I already mentioned, Genesis 1 tells us that God evaluated the whole spectrum, the whole creation, and he said, it's good. This is good. And what he had created was good. Adam and Eve had a, uh, um, a healthy amount of pressure, a healthy amount of responsibility, but they were in a perfect environment. They had a perfect communication with God. They had a perfect marriage. They had a perfect world to live in. There was no curse. But in verses 1 through 6, we have the history of how this perfect, stress-free world becomes a stress-filled world. It was completely, um, it, it, it was completed, pardon me, and it was universal when Adam partook of the uh, forbidden fruit and hearkened the voice of his wife and ate of the forbidden fruit as well. And so stress entered the world. It was brought on by the temptation of Satan, the choice of selfishness, and the choice to sin. We disobeyed a clear command of God, which he gave us back in chapter 2 and verse number 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat, or that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Um, there is no doubt in Adam's mind what would happen when he took a bite of that fruit. Then in verses 7 through uh, 13, we have the fall. We, the immediate, immediate result uh, effects of that sin, of that selfish behavior. Number one, their eyes were opened. They were faced with their sin. They realized that they were sinners and they saw their, the result of it, their nakedness. And they knew something had to be done. All of a sudden, we see a very stressful situation being introduced. Secondly, because their eyes were open, they had to scurry around and try to cover themselves. To, to cover their um, nakedness, cover their tracks, their sin. More stress was added. Thirdly, for the first time, they were fearful when they heard the voice of God. They were fearful to have God find them. 
And so more stress is added. And because of that, they ran and found a place to hide in the trees. More stress is added. Um, they, they knew they had to answer God, but they devised lies. They devised deceitful answers. More stress is added. And they laid blame on each other and the serpent, which, of course, not only um, added stress to the relationship with God, but it added stress to their relationship to each other. Adam and Eve, one to the other. <clears throat> their whole outlook on life had changed with just one sin. With just one sin. Innocence was replaced by guilt. Perfect communion with God was replaced by hiding in the trees in disgrace. Trust is replaced by distrust. Distrust of God. God doesn't have uh, my best desire or my best outlook in mind. Um, he's trying to keep things back from me, and so I'm going to have to get them myself. And distrust of each other. Love is replaced by fear. Peace is replaced by tension. Perfection is replaced by sin. And all of this was the result resulted in a stressful situation that God never intended man to bear. God never intended for us to have that upon our shoulders. But there was more stress to be added because not only were they guilty and not only was there tension amongst the, the, the two of them, but now there was going to be a consequence added a, a judgment added to um, that stress. And so in verses 14 through 19, we have the judgment. Our sin and our selfishness always bears consequences. It always brings a sentence that only further adds to our stress. This is what exists. This is the dead end at the road of disobedience. Remember David and Bathsheba. We see a very similar thing. Uh, David went down that road knowing that he was wrong, knowing that it was sin. Um, and, and when he got into trouble, all of a sudden tried to cover it up, just like Adam and Eve did. And uh, when he couldn't cover it up, um, then um, the... Nathan came and, and, and brought that judgment against him, and he just, it was too much for him to bear. And that is the result of that sin. It's like the guy that uh, recklessly speeds down the road and he gets in an accident. We responded to a guy over here uh, a couple weeks ago and, um, and uh, speeding down the road, couldn't take the corner, make the corner, and flipped four times into a field. But not only does he suffer from whatever physical uh, bruises and broken bones or internal bleeding or whatever it is that he suffers from, uh, also because of the danger he put other people's lives in, he's going to get slapped with a fine or some other thing um, for a consequence of that action. And so it adds stress upon stress when we disobey, when we are disobedient. What was the judgment as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. Well, verse number 14, first of all, it affected the whole uh, animal world. Verse number 14 affected the, the, the serpent, of course, was cursed above all cattle and beasts, but all cattle and beasts were cursed as well. The serpent above all, a serpent above all, but the, the all cattle suffered. We don't live in a vacuum. Our actions hurt other people, other things, hurt those around us. And every, everything suffered. Our sin affects everyone. Now, you know, we read about the kingdom age, the age of rest. In Isaiah 65 and 66, we read uh, many details about the kingdom age. Um, the animals will no longer be under the curse except for the serpent his is a permanent curse isaiah says the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and the dust shall be the serpent's meat 
because of um, his um, being taken over by, possessed of the devil and used in this original sin. In verse number 15, we see that it switches from the serpent itself, the animal, to the serpent, the devil, and Satan too was cursed and judged. And we still await the glorious day when that sentence will be enforced. And he will be um, bound eternally and thrown into the lake of fire. What a glorious day that will be. When, uh, he, when, when this, the, the fulfillment of this prophecy in Genesis 3.15, finally um, God brings to completion. Then we have the judgments upon the woman and the man given in verses 16 for the woman and 17 through 19 for the man. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. We read of four stressful things here. Um, one of them is childbearing would be a painful, sorrowful pro process. This was um, a, a change from something not sorrowful to something sorrowful. Now, the second thing, as I read it, I've, I've never, um, as I read this, this uh, verse, this is the interpretation that I come up with. I've never read a commentary that um, would agree with me, and maybe you won't either. But um, when I read this, it says, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And so, to me, it reads that, Greatly multiply thy sorrow and greatly multiply thy conception. Um, and so why would it say multiply thy conception? I think that it, it seems as though with the curse and the introduction of death into the world that um, the woman's uh, time that she could conceive and bear children was very limited and small compared to what God's intended plan was. He didn't intend. He intended for Adam and Eve to eat of the, gar of the, of the tree of life and live forever and, and never be limited. Um, but with the introduction of the curse and with the population dying, with this curse of death, the wages of sin being death, there was only a certain number of years that the woman could conceive. And from the wording, it seems as though um, he multiplied thy conception so that people didn't die off from, from, the, from the earth, from the world, um, so that they could um, still have a people being born upon the earth. I don't know if that's a proper uh, understanding of that verse or not, but that's what it seems to read to, to me. Then thirdly, um, her desire will be to her husband, and her husband would rule over her. And if you don't think that causes stress, you don't understand it. See, this is, this is a, re a result of the curse. Having children, okay? That, that, the children themselves are not a punishment. God says that they are, are, are a reward. Psalm, what was it? Um, is it 127? It says that, uh, verse number three, that says that the fruit of the womb is, is his reward. Children are the, God declares to be reward. But it comes with much sorrow. Much sorrow. Very stressful situation. And the marriage, which God declared in chapter two to be um, very good, when he performed the first ceremony, is now by time stressful and full of strife and sin, isn't it? And so um, there we have the stress added to the situation. Then God uses three verses to tell Adam his judgment. Cursed is the ground, thorns and thistles shall bring forth. Your daily life is going to be hard, sweat and labor um, for the food that you need and grow 
And then, at the end of it all, you're, you're, you're going to die. Your, your body is going to decay and go back to the dust from where, it, uh, where I brought it in the first place. The wages of sin is death. Disobedience brought God's judgment. That has been um, what, what has been, pardon me, perfect was now full of stress. The reason that, that the earth didn't bring forth all of these curses before was because God's presence was here. He came down and he walked in the cool of the day and, 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 and no decay could be around him. He was holiness and so everything thrived. Why? Because of the presence of God. His presence makes all things perfect. And, and when we draw near to him, the same thing happens. But sin broke that fellowship and it not only affected Adam, but affected the earth, the animals. It affects us. They felt the effects of the absence of God's presence. Right in the middle of all of this stressful situation, God puts a beacon of hope, a lighthouse. He puts a promise, a solution, a promise that the seed of the woman, which was Christ, in verse number 15, would bruise the head of the serpent, which was a deadly bruise, a crushing. And, of course, that happened when Christ died and rose again. God didn't want to leave Adam and Eve in failure. Satan was sure he wanted to. Satan was sure if, if he could just get Adam and Eve to sin, the world would be his. And, um, and, and God would reject the human race. But God didn't want to leave Adam and Eve in failure and defeat. And he doesn't want to do, leave us in failure and defeat either. Verse number 21 of this um, Genesis chapter 3 Blood was shed. Blood was shed and a covering was made for them. That This was a display of God's grace. Um, made coats of skin for clothing. And of course, they um, could not return to their uh, innocent state, their sinless condition. But God provided a solution for that sin problem. And God offers the same thing to you and me. What is the solution to that problem? God's presence. It is. Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is that rest? That rest is what Adam and Eve had before they sinned. Resting in the presence of God. What does it mean to be heavy laden? Stressed out. That's what it means. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, while we live on this earth, there's never going to be a time when you and I don't feel the effects of the curse. We're going to feel it. But we don't have to suffer those effects like the world suffers it. We don't have to. God doesn't want us to. Jesus told the Jews, it says that in John chapter 8, I think it's 31, right around there. He says that he said to the Jews that were believing on him, if ye continue in my word... Then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's what God wants for us. Make you free. The end of all stress will take place when we rise to be with Christ and be restored. Of course, that's the rapture. The Apostle Paul tells us about that. But um, once more, it's going to be what? When we're in the presence of God. Glorified bodies, presence of God. That's where we're going to have rest. And that's where we're going to have rest here on this earth as well. The closer we draw nigh to the Lord, the less stress we're going to have. The more rest we're going to have. Speaking of the rapture, the Apostle Paul says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, no longer stressed. And we shall be changed. What a glorious day. What a glorious concept. No more stress. No more sin. No more disobedience. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. You know, finally, all this will end when God permanently uh, ends it all. Um, we read about that in Revelation chapter 21. 
And that is uh, when he makes uh, all things new, the new heaven and new earth. And what does he do? He dwells with men. Once again, it's the presence of God. It's the presence of God that wipes away our tears. He says, and I heard a voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. The presence of God. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Even though this truth is future. Even though we know it's speaking of, of, uh, of eternity. God wants this for us today. To dwell in the presence of the Lord. David said in, in, in Psalm 31, verse 20, he said he found safety from the pride of men by what? Hiding in the secret place of the Almighty. Secret of his presence. What's the secret? Find the presence of God. Find the presence of God. What was that you spoke on when, when we were gone to Florida, Doc? Um, the secret place? Was that what you spoke on? Yes. Amen. The secret place. What's the secret place? That's where God is. That's where his presence is. Do the things he's commanded us to do. What's that start with? Knowing and reading the word of God. It's very simple. Simple, but sometimes not easy. Love the things he loves. Hate the things he, le he hates. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. When you get up in the morning, give the day to God instead of claiming it for yourself. Remove selfishness, sin, and arm yourself against Satan. And you'll find even, the middle, even in the middle of stressful situations, you'll have rest. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to seek thy presence on a daily basis. Help us to desire that um, you would be the one in control of our lives. That we would have stress or rest in the midst of a stressful world that we live in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and so we'll take time for your...